Hey guys, so one of the things I dislike the most about working with fiber is that it takes everything over. And because I live in a tiny house, I have zero space. I don't have a studio anymore, which is fine. I'm, I'm good with that. But it does mean that the kitchen has to kind of do double time and the bathroom is small enough that it's awkward to work in. I called you and I called you. We have eggs. I love to work with wool. I don't like to feel like I have to set everything else in the kitchen aside in order to do it. And I got this laundry washer from Avalon Bay and it's self-contained and when I'm done with the first rinse, what I can do is pop this off and put it into my watering jug to go put as a charging liquid for my hotbeds. So that manure water is really important. The other thing I wanted to talk about was your quality of wool. If you're a spinner, or a weaver or, or anything to do with fiber arts what your original wool is like is what determines the quality of your end product in the beginning I used trash wool wool that had all sorts of awful stuff in it that made a very slubby unbeautiful yarn let's just say that because it was for free and I had to spend a lot of time working with it and um, this is from Natalie and Amaste Farms. I will put the link in the description and also in the card to the video we did when we went and stayed with her. I have been watching her for years. Um, she's the one who taught me how to dye on YouTube and um, she has sent me some of her wool and her wool is coated. Not all of it is coated. Some of the long locks you cannot coat because then the um, they will get greasy and felt underneath the coat. But for her shorter fleeces she has absolutely gorgeous fleeces. And with some of them, you can just spin them from the locks if they're open and airy and don't have a lot of lanolin, lanolin in them. But some of them do have lanolin, and you want to wash that out. So this is some. Let's see if I can show you a little better. This is some of her wool. Isn't it gorgeous? There's no vegetable matter in it. That dark that you're seeing is lanolin. And so we're gonna go ahead and do this. And that lanolin and manure, I'm gonna catch in the water. I won't add soap yet because I wanna get that first rinse off and I want it to be non-toxic to my plants. And that way I'm kinda of killing two birds with two stones, with one stone because I get manure water, but I get my wool clean. And on top of that, I don't have bowls. That This is actually lunch that I have set up here. But I don't have bowls of wool everywhere. It can stay here, it can spin dry, and then I can dry it out on a tray. So, first thing first, this is always gonna be easier if you have a detachable hose. If you don't, it's okay. You just won't be able to work as easily as what you're gonna see me do. Now remember with this one, I had a hard time getting the lid off. There we go. And, when you're storing this, make sure it stays closed. We've got a little bit of, looks like we had a squirrel in here trying to get seeds and stuff. And so I don't really want that in my wool, so I'm gonna clean that out a little bit. Put the basket back in. Very straightforward. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some warm water. And I'm not going to put the wool in until I have the water ready. I haven't used this particular fleece a lot before. Some fleeces will felt easier than others, which means they clump together and become a solid mass and you can't open them and spin them. And so um, some fleeces can take more temperature uh, changes than others. Some can take more agitation than others. And so I'm not necessarily going to agitate this all I'm going to do is let it sit in it, and then I'm going to spin the water out. I do like to do very small batches. If your batch is small, then if you do it wrong, you're not losing all your wool. And it is much easier to get things clean when you do a small batch. Another little flake of something that came from the shed. So I'm going to take those out. 
and then I'm going to immerse this. And it, I do like to have it be warm. And one thing that I may find is that if it is really clean fleece, I won't really be able to get much manure out of it. This, fe this fleece is so clean. I mean, you, you have to come up and see this. That discoloration here, that discoloration is lanolin. It's not dirt. See how clean that water stain? You can see a little bit of discoloration with the um, over the top of my hand. So you can see there's maybe a little discoloration, but you can see my hand just fine. There's hardly any. There's hardly anything in there that could actually constant. And I need to take my ring off because that's catching. So I'm feeling stickiness in there, a little bit of stickiness, which is going to be lanolin. And I'm not seeing really any soiled pieces of wool. So it looks like I may not be able to save any of this for the garden bed. Oh, there's a little bit. I'm getting a tiny bit. It takes this fleece a year to grow. And so in that time, you can get a little bit of sweat, a little bit of lanolin, a little bit of not generally manure. You don't get manure unless it's at the hind end of the animal, but kind of the essence of the animal. And I do like to add that to my garden bed regardless. I feel like it adds character and good bacteria to my garden bed. I, If I have dirty wool that I don't want to use for spinning, I always add it to my garden bed as one of the carbon layers. Okay, girls, get your school done, please. So we're starting to get a little bit of what looks like very light manure tea, but it's not made out of manure. It's just essence of animal. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and let it go into this uh, watering can. start spinning. Okay, so what I see now is that if I want this to be really um, all going into the tub, I need to, or into my watering can, I need to put it lower. There we go. Now it should drain just fine. Yep, and there we go. Now, the hose is a little bit below the basket. The basket is actually holding things up. So I can put that lid on, stand that up. And then even though you can see that there is still gonna be water right here, that basket itself is held up above that. And because it has a plug on the end, see this, the plug on the end? Because it has the plug on the end, even as water is still maybe coming down a little bit, it doesn't matter. So look how pretty that is. Oh, and there goes the suction cup, so you don't want to let me tip it. Okay. Undo, please. Well, at least you know it won't be coming off the table. Okay, so that's what it looks like now. So I haven't added any shampoo to it. So the dirtiest of the water is now gone. The dirtiest of the water is now gone. I'm gonna take my jug out. And now I'm gonna turn it. And I'm going to add, I'm gonna fill the temperature of the wool itself to make sure I'm not adding anything in that's hot or cold compared to that. It's pretty much lukewarm. I'm gonna lift it up. water in. Again, making sure that it's not hotter or colder than the wool itself is right now. When you're spending a lot of money on fleece, you really want to be careful how you work with it. Okay, see how I have this turned away from the fleece? I'm going to add just a little bit of 
soap. And this is Natalie's soap as well, Namaste Farms. Natalie's soap, just for wool. because I don't want to lose any water yet. I want to let it sit in the soap. It is a little bit um, greasy. It has quite a bit of lanolin in it. So that soap is necessary to get that lanolin out. And you can already see that some of that dark is starting to break up in that soap. See how that's kind of breaking up? Those pieces that were sticking together are now trying to um, dissolve. So this is going to be really pretty when it's done. What, honey? Have you done your spelling? Have I seen it? Okay, you can see that instead of holding into locks that are kind of rigid, it's opening up. And that's the shampoo working. I want to let it um, open up, but at the same time, I don't want the water to cool down. If you let the water cool down, all the lanolin and nasty stuff stays in it again, kind of redeposits, especially with mohair. So I need to make sure my water stays warm. So I need to let it sit, but not for too long. And then I will see if I need to add some more shampoo. She also has a special shampoo that's used for when you're dying so that it will hold on to the fleece better. That actually looks really good. I think we'll probably do one more. Okay, so once again, I'm going to put the lid on. And this time, I'm going to open this into the sink. I'm going to get rid of anything that actually might keep the water from draining. sure if I can get the suction cups to release. There we go. That is really clean. Yeah. Oh, this is actually a lot softer than I thought. It is very soft, isn't it? Yeah, it's really soft. Okay, what are you supposed to be doing? Okay, I'm going to close that up. You see how dry this is? I can actually put this on my counter and it won't get anything wet. And then the fill line, you can see the max fill line for actual soiled anything. That's that's my understanding is that's for, for wool or clothing or whatever you're putting in here. That's the filling for that. You can put the water in higher, but that's where you want to stop with the clothes. Okay, I want a little bit more. Oh, we got a duck out. Now 
I can leave this in place and the kids can't get into it, I won't have anything falling into food while I'm making lunch. I really do think this is the ultimate fiber preparation tool and I'm super excited now to have it. It's a great tool. One thing I didn't realize, I just looked at the bag, and this is actually merino, which is well known for felting. It felts easily. I've spun a lot of merino, but I've never actually worked with a raw merino fleece, so I'm really excited. That's the merino. So, it's white, it's clean, it's pristine, it's beautiful, so we're going to spin it out one more time. We're going to spin it out one more time and then we're going to rinse it. Make sure that your wash water, rinse water, every water that you put in there is the same temperature and that you're not using your wand to um, agitate the wool. You want to keep it turned away from your wool. Don't let it get agitated. And um, yes, Merino is known for having a lot of lanolin in it. And so, I'm really happy with how it's turning out though. Super happy. I'm going to go ahead and spin it. I do find that putting one hand on top just stabilizes it. If you're, if you're trying to just turn it like this as the water leaves, oh, well now it's gonna call me a liar. Now it's doing fine. I thought before that it had a little bit of a wobble to it as I was trying to get rid of the water, but now it's doing fine. Maybe I just needed to get the suckers wet. The other thing I like about this is that because it has a lid on it, it keeps the, the water warm. Instead of having a very fast temperature change, it holds it at that higher temperature, which dissolves the lanolin, lets the soap do its work. So we're gonna put that back in, and this is the rinse. Um, Natalie's soap is not clingy, so I only need to rinse once. Okay, so there's that. Natalie's soap just rinses off really quick. So I would I would almost think that the rinse water itself would be fine in your garden, or at least at the base of um, trees. There we go. Now, if you're gonna wash in this thing, you can agitate with it slightly by changing directions like that. I don't know what that's going to do to the fleece because it is slightly agitating. But there's no beater bar in the middle beating it up. So that's just agitation from the water changing directions. If you let the water drain out before you start to spin, then it drains out quickly. If you if you can just wait and let it drain out on its own and then spin it. Bite it open. I do struggle with that. I wish they had these little I, I wish they had better little knobs for opening it. There we go. Okay. So, there we have it. Beautiful, awesome, pristine, amazing. It's totally clean. So I'm ready to set this out and let it air dry. And there's, there's no drip. You see there's no drip no drip and because it has no drip it means I can pretty much put it anywhere to dry without it damaging anything in the house all right what am I gonna dry it on I know it looks like a cloud it does doesn't it in order to store this I'm gonna leave the lid off of the hose and I'm not gonna connect this. I'm gonna put it upside down and make sure that it can dry thoroughly. And I'm not gonna put the wool in anything that is going to keep it from drying thoroughly. It, it has to dry before we can use it at all. It is a cloud, a cloudy day. There's no sunshine, but when I opened this, it was very warm inside. So I'm gonna take this warm 
sheep manure uh, tea and pour it in to recharge. Okay, so that's my wool washing video, my hotbed update, a little bit of the bunnies, and um, it is quite chilly today. It is freezing weather, not warm at all, and um, it's kind of fun to play with this kind of stuff when otherwise you'd be trapped in the house. So make sure to go check out Natalie from Namaste Farms. Her scrapbooks are to die for. Scrapbooks? No, her scrap boxes are to die for. They are my favorite colors combined together in unusual ways with fiber and ribbon and bells and buttons and all sorts of fun things. So that's super fun. She has her shampoo there and also her raw fleeces, but you do have to be on a list in order to be able to have access to the raw fleeces because she only sells those to preferred customers who've already shopped with her on other things. So hopefully you enjoy that. Soon we'll get around to spinning that wool and we'll talk to you later. Every year I, keep so many X amount of sheep, whatever I decide, then I don't put blankets on them because you can't grow long fleeces in the blankets. So they're jacketed and some people think, they'll be, they'll say, oh my gosh, isn't it mean to jacket the animals in this heat? But they're like windbreakers. They yeah. have to be able to breathe. Otherwise the wool will mold. So they have to let water in and they have to let it out both. Um, or it would felt them. So. Fine wool breeds, these are not fine wools. Fine wool breeds are very gregarious, which means they like to flock. These are not gregarious sheep, so they will, they'll like try to break apart and it makes it really hard on the dogs. So these are the, lo these are longer fleeces. They look a little bit of a mess right here, but this will all blow out with a blower. But this is when, you know, these ones are probably a half a year long. And so I'll start to shear them either when I think that they're gonna start felting or, um, or next year, they'll stay on until next year. But this cottony look right here means that it probably won't, I'll probably end up um, shearing this one. But you can see that it has the lamb tips on it, which means they've never been shorn. And the lamb tips often have like little curled ends, little tiny little ringlets. And that's how you tell. And, but some of them, these are beautiful pieces. Even in, even in my heat, these sheep are from, you know, they're an English breed and they, um, you know, 80 degrees is about, you know, maximum for them. And here it can get 120, but because they're, they were raised here, their set point, their internal thermometer, they can handle the heat pretty well. My breeds, because there's such a bottleneck of genetics, they, they don't, they're not very vigorous and they are not disease resistant. And so like putting them on grass, people think it's so mean, you know, oh my gosh, how do you, they live without grass? Let me tell you, without grass, your things like barber pole are non-existent. And so um, it actually works better for them to be on dry lots and to have, you know, it's expensive because I have to feed them. However, I get to control their feed, you know, really well. And I don't have things like, you know, um, bloat really very often. It, it, if I, if, if something bloats, it's like, it's a rare occasion. But so this, so anyway, so the whole point is, is that I have this mobile shearing stand so that I can just move the stand rather than the animals. Because if I, if I had to move the animals, it would it'd take so long. And, so did you guys build most of the fences and most yeah, of the everything, everything except for the house all of this like the studio and everything um and you know we were right in the racehorse business before we started well i'm the one that got really into to um to sheep because I had had so many kids, you know, I have five children and um, four of them were born within the span of like six years. And so they were small and I was afraid they would get in with the racehorses, open a gate and she be killed. Yeah, so exactly. I was the, and I have, you know, like I said, I have a master's and a bachelor's in animal science. So the, I was just trying to rack my brain, what kind of animals could we raise, you know, that, that would not hurt them. Yeah. And then since they don't have any natural defenses, sheep and goats, I chose sheep. And that's how I ended up making yarn, is I picked a breed of sheep actually that has the little long wool, the dready, dreadlocks kind of looking thing, because I that was just the most, the prettiest to me, and that's how the whole thing started. And then I was like, what am I gonna do with all this wool? 
Doesn't life take you in strange directions? <laughs> it, did, it really actually did. Because a lot of people get sheep because they were hand spinners. And mine, I didn't really care about hand spinning. That was just, a, you know, that was just something that I was learned how since my animals made this product. Time. Steady now. Lacey, Lacey. Hey, time. Steady, steady, step. Time. 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 Hey, hey. Stand. Um, and then I just go through and I have to find who is ready. And I have a lot that are like borderline. And so the, the, most of these, if I share right now, will be first time sharing. Thanks. There you are. Because I'll put like all the skirting will usually go in one of these, which I can combine. What was left out here it was skirting. And then I'll go through this and try and shake it out and what a lot of people don't realize is that the long wool breeds unless they've been on the animal for um for a long time and it's partially cotted they don't come off in one piece people expect it to be like a merino where it's so dense and these aren't dense there's like what is it 1800 follicles per square inch on a long wool and like 2800 on a on a um fine wool and so you know they're so dense that they will stay together whereas you know these even crossbreds because this should be a Coriadale, which is a medium wool crossed with a long wool. And so medium wool still are pretty, can be pretty dense, especially the ones with the spina fleeces, the ones I have. And so I just go through and I, you know, usually you'd be able to, it was all in one piece. Go and, and this is like called the New Zealand um, pattern. So it's, it's like a standard pattern that you always do the same time to wait over and over again. And then you flip it that way and see now there's the pelt. Like it would, it's almost like it's a whole sheet right here. See? So I can go through it and I can just grab it by sections. Like I know that I don't want the bridge, right? The bridge I'm not interested in. And around right, right the, the neck because the blanket doesn't cover it so it gets vegetation. And so those parts I don't want. So I will take it and I will like roll it. Try to shake any second cuts off. There's not, usually I'm pretty good about not getting very many. Because if I make a mistake, I leave it on the animal rather than try and make the animal look pretty and cut it off and then it would just be a second that we would throw away. And then here you can see, you know, this part is negligible. It's a britchy. Britch. More britch. So the, at the hind end of the animal was back here and then when I flipped it, it's over here. And the britch is like the side of the leg right here and you can tell because it's really flat. So people a lot of time are still, one of the tests for the master um, spinner certification from Olds College in Canada is like you have to take a fleece and know what end is what and it's really not hard unless you have a super good merino because the, the bridge will always tell you it's always you know it's never as nice except in really good merinos so and then I just roll it in sections and because I sell by I heavily skirted and by the pound and so like I, I don't sell whole fleeces to people and then I don't sell usually to people I don't know and I have a way I have a pre-order for my fleeces <laughs> so people get mad sometimes they'll write me and they'll say how you know how do i become one of your customers but like like if you're going to yell at me in an email like that definitely isn't one of the ways because you know I, I i really i have a really uh, a very solid um very solid amount of people that have been supporting me for years and i can't sell you know if they are buying all my wool it's not fair to them that supported me in the dry times to then take on more customers 
and sell the fleece that they want to somebody else. Yeah. So I don't do that. I pre-sell to my to the people I know, and if I was that I didn't have, if I had more, then I would allow. I just would never. That would never happen because the people then would buy more. If I had extra, then my customers that have been my longtime customers would just buy, you know, more pounds. So it is hard to become one of my. Usually the best way is so. What I do is I tell people that you know if they want to become a customer of mine for my raw wool, that the best way is to like either be in the dye course or buy scrap boxes, and then I get to know you through that. Otherwise, um, you know, buying a, a raw wool for me isn't I mean, isn't probably possible. This is so. I have the special Romney wool that I spun. I love Romney because it's soft and very strong, and I did that in a thread weight, so it's very very fine. And I just, I just wanted something special. And so I, I couldn't do it all in mohair because mohair will turn out to be stiff and difficult for me to use in a fine uh, cabled pattern. It's just, it's thicker. But I love how soft it is and it will add a note of shine to the yarn. And so now I'm doing the third bobbin. This is gonna be interesting. I finally found the pattern. It took me forever to find it. Finally bought the pattern. <laughs> it took me a really long time to commit to it because I really wanted it to be so perfect for her. Um, so how long ago was it, Corinne? Was it like four months ago that we decided to do this? It's taken me this long just to commit to a pattern. picker and so um, this is after I've hand carded it if it wasn't so clean I couldn't have hand carded it it would have retained all of the nastiness in there um, but it's super super clean it's a pretty rust color this is the first of the hats and um, again I don't like to use the regular carding combs let's see where did I put them um, I don't like to use the regular carding cones because they just don't get things clean enough and they create a ratty fiber. Uh, the only reason I'm able to do that is because the fiber is so clean and lofty. And I'll probably have to use it for the Angora. Just because the teeth on the comb carders are so far apart that with Angora it, it would kind of send fluff up everywhere. You can see how fluffy he is. And you can see he has a little bit of vegetable matter. So... I'm gonna let him walk around for a minute, get a drink, see if I can bring it over. As a huge amount of fiber for one little bunny. There we go. There's our next sweater. That is the color crab apple from Gray Wool uh, dyes, and I finished that at about 11 o'clock last night. This should be ready for me to start knitting with in probably about six hours with the wood stove going. Isn't that pretty? Try to make sure you guys can see this. I connect my wool, make sure it has some good space to catch hold. See that? Take your, rest your wool, wrap it up around your arm. If you want to be able to adjust this to farther down or farther up, you can do that. 
the reason I like the the um You can touch him, honey. No, I'm gonna play the jumper won't jump. Jumper won't jump on ya. What, honey? I never knew the baby son's goat, goat um, had that kind of wool. You never knew that? Yeah. Because it's kind of black? Yeah. That's what Jumper looked like when she was a baby. What? Are they going to turn white? Yep, they're going to turn white. Why is that one yellow? Because yeah. he pooped while he was still in his birth sack. And that's, so that's called meconium, and it means that we're glad he made it, because sometimes they breathe in their poop and it makes them sick. Are they sick? Nope, they're just fine. She did a really good job. him off all the way yet. So let's go away and we'll let her lick him off. All right, so first off, shout out to my t-shirt. These are my Get Dirty t-shirts. I also have, what's the other one called? Um, Live Your Crazy t-shirts that have more of a male appearance to it. They have a fishing pole and a rifle crossed over it. So that one's fun, but I really liked the Live Your Crazy logo so we changed it so we do have some new shirts coming up that have a chicken on it kind of to go back to the homesteading theme that's closer to what my get dirty shirt is but instead of live you're crazy it doesn't have me on it